So I'm going to read from my new chapbook, Bible Elementary, which is over there. And the story I'm going to read from, going to read from, is called Funeral in Fresno. The title is pretty descriptive of the uh, content. Let's see. At Fresno's Adventist Church, Tucson and his family and the whole Freeman clan came to lay their lady to rest. Well, meanwhile, their old reverend came to send her off in the time of his man apostle. These weren't the most compatible ambitions, but the reverend knew that there was such a thing as a badly executed funeral, and he didn't want to preside over another such spectacle. Only a couple days before, he had overseen the funeral for a young lady who lived life too hard and too fast, segueing from a short childhood into an overlong adolescence, and finally a terrible death from the plague of plagues. Some things the Reverend had learned were best buried quick and not lingered over too long. But the funeral lagged and lagged and dragged on well past tears and into numbness, though there were tears. One of the deceased shady associates stumbled in her stilettos and managed to heave herself upon the, the coffin during processional. And the whole thing eventually became a lot like the lady's sordid life and more sordid death. So now the Reverend, who'd known the made truth for 30 years and more was determined not to let a good woman's funeral go bad. To that end, <clears throat> he ignored May's twin granddaughters who were hissing audibly at each other in the front row and ticked off his opening remarks with rapid efficiency of an auctioneer. He'd always prided himself on his BCC status, black, Christian, and charismatic, and arranged, <laughs> and arranged his sermons to accent those virtues. But now he reminded himself that such blessings were two-sided, and that matter of fact, he bore some of the blame for the excesses of the recent funeral. It was one of those sermons when the words ran away with him, and he had become eloquent and lost his sense. Their throat is an empty tomb, Psalm 5-9. He should have heeded those sacred words, but the tragic nature of the deceased life and death had stirred him to rambling. Now, May Truth hadn't lived a life of sin, so he wasn't moved to any eloquence. Only a few appropriate words. She had been a good woman, he said. Maybe a little sad here and there, but that was to be expected amidst a bad world and bad men. None of the world's sin could bother her now, now that she was in heaven, he reasoned. So this was no time to be sad, let alone them excessive carryings on, he counseled the congregation. And that was all he needed. That was all that needed to be said, he said. He checked his timepiece. Now for the remembrances. L.A. Freeman sauntered forward with his usual smooth confidence. Even as, at his advanced age, so old and full of days, he remained exceptionally light on his feet, old Rev noticed. Not even his wife's death, it seemed, could slow his roll or break his stride. An exacting union the two of them must have shared, one living a low-stress, no-stress lark, the other bearing everything in her big, breaking heart. Now L.A. was out of life, and he had no one to blame but himself. The best he could do for her now was give her a good semi-off, which is one thing L.A. almost surely would manage. He could still talk his best, still retain his wit, rarely resorted to the obscurity of silence like so many men of age. If there was one thing May had always loved about her man, it was that he was a wonderful talker. L.A., she used to say, had his way with words. Now the man with the words unfolded all six to four inches of himself out of his seat, down the aisle, and up to the pulpit. The Reverend stepped aside and passed off stage. Then he watched his L.A. reach one long, thin hand into his pants pocket and came out with a badly wrinkled sheet of paper. Old Rev wondered just how long L.A. had been carrying it around with him. It was so crumpled up. He heard the granddaughters giggling and wanted to join them. Once L.A. began to speak, of course, it was clear that however worn the thing was, it hadn't been much time to compose it. <clears throat> Now, he intoned, coughing, clearing the years out of his voice. Now, I done wrote this right here. I want y'all, all y'all to understand. I wrote this here. Wasn't no one helping me, no one overseeing me like if I was a preacher. Had me the team saying, go and put this here, put that there. Making, making it sound all pretty for me. Now, I done, I done this on my own. These are my honest to God words. And if any, anyone here don't care for them, they have got their own, that's their own misconceptions at work. Because who here knew, knew May Truth better than me? I challenge anyone here on that. I know the girl, what was it? When we get married. Long time, Jesus. 
I met her out the pen and was going to church where all the fine and attached girls be. Spend all Sunday morning getting dressed, show up on the church steps with my handkerchief at 12 o'clock. <laughs> uh, make like I've been like uh, make like I've been in there sweating, worshiping with the congregation. They had no idea I've been in jumpsuits, more in church pews, but love, let me tell you, she was the funniest chick in the world. Couldn't take Birmingham, broke out with the crop each year, couldn't take Chicago, tested her, her religion. Why well, I'm so shocked by my, my boy Bobby Jitterbug ass. He was her favorite. So I'd always figured him for a prime square. But now I finally brought her out here, came to this small Fresno world, looked nice at a distance. But wouldn't you know it? Found us a home here for when it was good times or bad, came from plenty of folk. When we made it into death do us part, that's worth something I have it, no matter what nobody say. At which point his speech disintegrated into grumbling Alabama ob obscurities. Excuse me, <laughs> grumbling at Alabama ob obscurities, and he seemed to grow tired and even serene. Then his only son, Bobby, came forward. He was crying all down his cheeks even before he offered his words to the congregation. It wasn't easy to make out what he had to say, choked up as he was. But old Rad listened close and came to understand that he had loved his mother deeply and suffered greatly with the passing. What I remember is, he halted over each word, is how much she loved us, how she would love us each and every day of her life. How, my Lord, she was my mother. He put his head in his hands to stifle down his tears, but his words still came out of his throat with heat and hurt. It was never easy, not in the places we live. No rock to hide, try and hide your face. Rock yells up. Bobby's shoulders shook in great old tears, welled up in his eyes again, but his voice was steadier when he began to speak. Now there were a few murmured amens urging him on. I remember how she took to me, me being her only son. She treated me like a prince. My sisters, they did get a little anxious, a little mad, but it was only love, I think. Amen, someone shouted. Rock yelled up, no hiding place. That's, that's it. That's how it goes. He was losing his way again. Come on, son. Come on. Come on. You almost home. That's the song. Bend time. His words trailed away into a no man's land of dry sobs. The reverend, who had never wept in public, wondered how much must hurt the throat to cry dryly and speak all at the same time. He was full of fascination as he started toward the pulpit. And then Bobby turned on him, his eyes red as brimstone. Old Rev hesitated. Again, shaken in the sight. It had been a long time since his own personal dungeon had shook, and though he regularly witnessed the, the phenomenon in other people, its intensity in Bobby Freeman touched him. Maybe because it was a man crying this time, maybe because it was May Truth's son, that harsh Lily's husband. He wasn't sure what it was about Bobby, Bobby's eyes that made him hesitate, but he drew back. And now I will skip ahead a little bit. Um, <coughs> His job, the Reverend decided, had grown progressively harder. All things are full of labor, he thought to himself, looking out at the individual face of each one, looking to him for some articulation of the world, and black, brown, and white faces come to mourn into question. With their eyes like searchlights upon him, all things are full of labor, he thought, and man cannot express it. Ecclesiastes 1.8. He felt a deep urge to read to them from Ecclesiastes so that they wouldn't be so damn ready to whisper this and that amongst themselves, and then go look to him and confirm their agitated gossip about Bobby or May or God. The Reverend felt a sudden desire to shirk his responsibility, insofar as reassurance was that responsibility. He remembered how, in certain translations, Ecclesiastes began chapter 1, verse, first verse, with a preacher saying, nothing of nothings, nothing of nothings, all is nothing. He hadn't read these translations, and thus had no first-hand knowledge of them, but he had heard of them. Now the thought of their unadulterated hopelessness consoled him. He wasn't in a good state to be leading anybody, despite his title. He had no special words, certainly no assurances, other than that a funeral was no place to linger, because time was short. Time and life were short, and even death came and passed as quickly as a moment. He had heard scientific theories positing that time was not linear, but in fact proceeded parallel to itself in never-ending repetition, so that as soon as people died, they returned to life's beginnings and, re and relived their time on Earth. By this logic, no one ever really died. They only passed between similar universes in a sort of infinite renewal. The Reverend didn't know what to make. <clears throat> what to
What to make of such thinking? He didn't know whether to be attracted or repelled by the idea that May Truth had returned to the womb as she breathed her last and he mourned her death. The mourners needed him now. Their big, tearful eyes said so. But he had nothing for them. He called on the Freeman boy, who was scheduled to read the last for him. And so the child comes to read, and the reverend notes the crowd. And now watching their child pass up the aisle and onto the stage into the pulpit, fascinating every eye with his approach, it was like the reverend could see the whole grapevine being burnt under in flames. The boy was only about as tall as a stock of cotton in the field, but the way he held his head so high, his back so straight, could make you forget how small and young he was. And then, then up at the pulpit, the way his brown eyes trained on the distance before him, it seemed as if he were seeing through and into something deeper, further on, beyond the reverend and the congregation and the church and the funeral all together. He watched his Tucson found the footstool hidden inside the pulpit hollow. The child hopped onto the support and adjusted the microphone without help. Then he started to undo the Oregon folds of the paper he'd taken from his pocket. He raised it up in the air and the light, then set it down. He took his time and lingered coolly over his preparations, like he knew what he was doing. The reverend left his seat on the stage and walked behind the curtain into the dark backstage area. He had to be careful not to wander blindly the sharp objects or things fragile enough to easily dislodge and topple to the ground with embarrassing crescendo. It reminded him of being a young father, having to get up in the middle of the night in the pitch black to do this or that for his son, and praying he did not step on another Lego or Lincoln log. He still didn't know if those things transmitted to toxins, tetanus, some devilment or another that Ralph Nader might have warned the world about when the Reverend was too busy serving God to notice. It was not uncommon for the Reverend to do this. His parishioners were familiar with him taking a moment to himself during proceedings. He took a deep, solid breath into his lungs, just as his meditation teacher had taught him to do. The Buddhists were all unrepentant heathens, but damn if they didn't know how to relax. <laughs> the Reverend did not but concede that truth. He would still be able to hear the child speak from the alleyway out back, still open the exit door and walked outside. It was a hot, wind-swept afternoon. Stepping out from the church felt like walking right into the blistering path of a blow dryer set to high. He gritted his teeth and squinted his eyes. Hey now, a sluggish, desiccated voice called in his direction. Hell if it ain't him, another said. Hey, Rev, we L.A.'s friends. Figures, thought the Rev. Gee, damn, figures. Thank you.